it's my pleasure to speak to you about the use of imaging for image-guided biopsy and treatment. Um, I have a, a couple disclosures, uh, consulting uh, from uh, uh, Blue Earth Diagnostics, and Cornell is a recipient of a, a research uh, in-kind donation. Um, so I'll start by talking about the use of uh, imaging for biopsy targeting, and then the techniques that we use for uh, image fusion. And uh, I'll conclude with some of the uh, imaging considerations for focal therapy. Uh, so imaging for biopsy targeting, uh, we've heard a little bit about this already. Uh, as uh, many of you know, the NCCN uh, currently recommends consideration for uh, the use of imaging after a negative systematic biopsy. Um, and uh, this is uh, further modified by the precision trial that Dr. Vickers uh, very elegantly described a little earlier. Um, and I think when you look at this um, pie chart of all the subjects that were included, you see very nicely that there's a, a cutoff. Um, sorry, I'm going to go back one. Um, where uh, that there is this um, increased number of clinically significant cancers and decreased number of insignificant cancers, but that the total number of cancers was very similar, slight increase with the image uh, targeting component. Uh, I think the important thing to consider is that um, almost a, a quarter of subjects uh, didn't require a biopsy at all. Uh, and so the total number of biopsies is much fewer in the image uh, targeted biopsy only uh, uh, cohort. Um, and so now we have uh, a number of level one evidence that shows that uh, image fusion uh, uh, and uh, image guided uh, biopsy uh, provides uh, similar value to uh, traditional uh, systematic biopsies. Uh, and uh, as uh, Dr. Heider also uh, very nicely described earlier, we have this pathway for how to consider um, when to do uh, image fusion targeted biopsy. Um, and it's based on this breakdown of subjects uh, where, or patients. Um, when you look at your input population, um, you see that uh, for a uh, negative MRI, uh, nearly all of them will have no cancer um, or will have uh, grade group one. But there is a small but potentially significant number of patients um, with clinically significant cancer. The hope is that uh, these patients would be caught with follow-up uh, uh, diagnostic uh, techniques um, before it becomes uh, extraprostatic. Uh, and that brings us to what are the techniques that we use. And again, some of this uh, was very nicely described by Dr. Heider earlier, um, but the MPMRI is a multi-parametric MRI. It currently includes uh, T2-weighted imaging, diffusion-weighted imaging, Dynamic contrast imaging is still recommended. Spectroscopic imaging is now considered optional. Um, and each of these components has different value. So the T2-weighted imaging is the primary pulse sequence that we use for anatomic characterization uh, and for staging. The diffusion-weighted imaging with the apparent diffusion coefficient map is the most specific. Dynamic contrast imaging is more sensitive. And I'll show you as we talk about the use of imaging for uh, therapy planning and for follow-up, um, why it can be very important in those scenarios. For detection, however, um, it adds less value, and so biparametric imaging for detection may be a consideration. Um, and as uh, Dr. Heider alluded to, technique is crucial. So here you see um, a, the ADC map with this subtle anterior lesion with a B value of 800, it's iso intense to the rest of the prostate. It's not distinct. Only by using a true high B value image can we see that this is uh, an actual lesion on the uh, DWI. Similarly, dynamic contrast enhancement also requires high temporal resolution. So you can see here that uh, the early enhancement image very nicely shows this tumor uh, in the transition zone. Um, and that only eight seconds later, it begins to blend in with the rest of the prostate. Um, one uh, important consideration is that for pharmacokinetic mapping, um, where the uh, software will automatically generate the uh, perfusion map, 
Um, this provides basically a similar image to the early enhancement map. And so while it's not required, it may actually be faster for interpreting images uh, to have the automatically generated pharmacokinetic map. The other important consideration is PIRADS uh, version 2 and version 2.1 is designed for assessing primary significant cancer. So cancer in the prostate and uh, cancer that's not been treated. It does not address a number of issues. Uh, it doesn't address PET scans or ultrasounds. Uh, as we heard earlier, there's a different assessment system for ultrasound. It doesn't specifically address treatment planning. We've uh, tried to uh, come up with a paradigm for biopsy, but treatment is still not within uh, the uh, standard uh, uh, assessment guidelines. And then after therapy, while you can use PIRADS as an assessment system, the risk categories no longer apply. And so it's not clear that PIRADS is the appropriate system after treatment. Um, so here's a, a brief simulation for those of you that haven't seen how this works, where uh, during the image fusion component, here's the ultrasound and here's the reformatted tetoated image. And as the practitioner sweeps through the prostate, when you get close to the level of the target, the target will appear on the image. Once it's in plane, it turns into a true uh, targetoid appearance, uh, and then you simply move the uh, needle guide until it traverses the target, uh, at which point you deploy uh, the, uh, the biopsy needle. There are a number of different um, fusion methods. Each of them has their own advantages and disadvantages. Uh, there's the articulated arm method, where the arm can be used to stabilize the probe, um, but can be cumbersome when learning to use the probe. There's electromagnetic tracking, which is a little bit simpler to learn early on, but does suffer potentially from electromagnetic interference. Uh, and then there's image registration, which is effectively retrospective, that you move the probe until you are in the appropriate position, uh, tap a foot pedal, and it will do a 3D analysis of the prostate to see uh, if you are truly in line with the target. This has the advantage, though, that it is less susceptible to patient motion. Um, there are a number of limitations of image fusion. Um, so when looking at when does uh, image fusion targeting fail, fail uh, it's uh, most uh, often seen with a fusion of uh, mistargeting. And there are a number of uh, reasons why this can happen. It can be an incorrect uh, region of interest uh, designed by the, the radiologist. It can be an inherent uh, compromise of the uh, technology. Uh, and it can also be a practitioner uh, error. Um, but there's also the problem, as we heard from Dr. Vickers, of MRI overstaging. Um, those lesions which are sonographically visible are much easier to target. And there are some simulations that suggest that cognitive uh, fusion, meaning not using software, is inferior to software fusion. There's also a number of technical advantages that uh, we can put into place, such as elastic deformation, where we try to conform the MRI. We, uh, uh, change the overall structure to match that that we see with the ultrasound. Um, there's also the uh, consideration of inbore versus image fusion. Um, and so there are different advantages and disadvantages. Um, inbore targeting has the advantage of direct imaging confirmation, um, whereas image fusion has been shown to be accurate to up to within three millimeters. Um, there are some areas of the prostate that can be harder to target with image fusion, uh, but it can be an overall faster technique. Um, there's a relatively uh, straightforward method to add systematics uh, if you still think that that's valuable. Um, however, we may not, no longer need to do systematics in all cases. Um, there's also the consideration of sedation versus anesthesia, uh, and then both of them require dedicated uh, hardware. Um, so comparing the two techniques, uh, a, a study done in 2015 uh, and another one in 2017, a meta-analysis, showed that there's no significant difference in terms of the detection of clinically significant prostate cancer. But a single uh, institution study done uh, this year um, by uh, um, UT Southwestern uh, showed that there was a, st a statistically significant uh, increased detection rate in the inbore biopsies. Now, it may be that this was a screened population, 
uh, and that you're not looking at the same subjects. Um, but there may be, what it suggests is that there are some scenarios where uh, in-bore biopsy has advantages. Uh, and that brings us to imaging for focal therapy. Um, so imaging for focal therapy can compromise, uh, uh, include everything from uh, image-guided radiation therapy to uh, high-intensity focus ultrasound to laser. It can be done with either image fusion or in-bore. There's no specific protocol that's recommended, and there are some components that are technique-specific. So irreversible electroporation is currently MRI-incompatible, um, whereas uh, HIFU can be done either with image fusion or uh, in-bore. Um, and then the post-treatment appearance will vary. And so one of the important questions is um, the difference between thinking about biopsy and ablation. And so both of them have this core question, where is it? But it's not the same question. For biopsy is, where is its center? Where do you want to send your biopsy? For ablation is, where is its edge? How much of it do you need to treat? And so when we look at uh, the imaging appearance, um, we can see that uh, the post-treatment appearance can be very different uh, between um, uh, focal therapy, uh, treated uh, lesions, and uh, uh, residual cancer. You can see here that um, where there is a focal treatment, that there's basically low signal on all the pulse sequences. Um, but on the high B-value DWI and uh, dynamic contrast enhancement, we can see that recurrent cancer has a significantly different appearance. Uh, this is another example of laser ablation, where we see a similar thing, where the successfully treated region has high signal on the ADC, in this case, low signal on the high B-value DWI, no enhancement, whereas recurrent disease uh, has a very typical appearance uh, to uh, what we would see for primary cancer with low signal on the ADC, high signal on the high B-value DWI, and early enhancement. Um, and so that brings us to the question of tumor volume assessment. Um, the earliest studies looking at tumor volume assessment uh, thought that the t 2 images may actually overestimate the uh, total volume. Uh, newer studies suggest that the MRI may actually underestimate the volume, but it's important to consider what technique was being used to assess tumor volume. And uh, the first study uh, done at, at UCLA was actually using the same contours done for biopsy planning. So again, a, a contour that was designed to provide the highest likelihood of clinically significant cancer. Uh, a very nice study done uh, by the group at the uh, University of Chicago uh, led by uh, Idakin Odo, showed that there's a very d uh, significant difference in the volume assessment uh, between T2 diffusion and DCE, with DCE showing a much closer uh, adherence to the true tumor volume. Uh, and then there's a number of considerations for focal therapy uh, imaging. Again, the MRI will underestimate the size. PSA will not extinguish. And there are no standard set for uh, how to assess uh, the prostate. Um, there's a number of changes that occur after treatment, as we saw earlier. Um, and so I'd like to acknowledge um, my colleagues at Cornell uh, and across the country at UCLA, Sloan Kettering, uh, Nijmegen, uh, Duke, uh, Chicago, and uh, importantly to our vendor collaborators. And I think the take-home points are uh, MRI-targeted biopsy is as good or better than systematic biopsy. Fusion platforms uh, vary depending on individual preference. MRI uh, underestimates the volume, but DCE uh, least of all. And post-treatment imaging relies on uh, adequate high B-value imaging and dynamic contrast. Thank you very much.